So um, one of the things that we we uh, care about here is uh, this sentence. So we use the connector in Sentinel to set up ingest logging using data collection rules. So this is a way of bringing data into the Microsoft Sentinel workspace. So the question is, what are data collection rules? So let's talk about that real quick. So data collection rules are ways of centrally determining how we collect and process logging telemetry that is sent to Azure. And that may be performance telemetry. It can be Windows security logs. It can be IIS logs, right? Um, it, it can be Linux logging. Um, it's just a way of saying, these are the kind of logs I want to retrieve from these VMs, and I want to send them to this uh, location, um, in, in, in our case, um, uh, in, in Azure Monitor or in our log analytics workspace. So some of the data collection rules will be created and managed by Azure Monitor, but we can also use them to customize data collection for Sentinel. Now, when we create a data collection rule, there are a certain number of, of uh, 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 topics or, or, or aspects of it that need to be considered. So for example, what type of data is being collected? So that is what we refer to as the data source type. So like I said, that can be things like your performance data, your Windows event data, your IIS logs, whatever. So, so, so you're just telling it, what is the, the, the kind of logging I'm, I'm uh, collecting from this machine? You also have to, have to tell it um, who are the target virtual machines that the DCR is gonna be associated with. So that's what we're looking at here. Now, this is kind of interesting to, to think about. So what this is, is saying is that you may have four VMs. However, each VM may have associations with multiple data collection rules, right? So we've got an association here um, with the data collection rule that is uh, relevant to central IT default. And so this is collecting information about Microsoft performance and it's sending it to this uh, workspace called uh, uh, workspace A. However, the same machine has an association with another data collection rule that uh, covers Windows events. And in that case, we're sending uh, the Windows event data to workspace B. So, and, and, and we see the same thing uh, with all these others, that there's multiple associations with a single VM because we might need the logging for different reasons. Say, for example, you've got a developer that's working on an application and they need to see how their application is performing. They may have a data collection rule that is specific to performance because that's what they care about. And so they can uh, run queries against the performance data and, uh, and, and see how their application is performing. On the other hand, you might have the SOC team um, in, in central IT that cares about security events. And so the security events off that machine go into a different workspace so that we can query those security events. So it all depends on what the, 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 the use of the data is um, uh, and, 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 and what type of data collection rules you've set up. So, um, just make sure that, that, that you understand that you can associate multiple data collection rules with the same uh, machines and, and send that data to different locations. <clears throat> um, now, because this allows such uh, granularity of, of data collection and uh, the, the, the types of data that gets pulled into a workspace, um, uh, it's important to keep DCRs as simple as possible and um, use as few data sources um, as, as possible. And it's also important to keep the list of collected items in each data source uh, very clean and oriented to the observability scope of, of what you're collecting here. In other words, don't clutter your workspace with so much data that it becomes hard for for the consumers of that data to uh, find the, the the right data, or it it, it becomes uh, just a 
you know, kind of a garage sale of, of data uh, where where nothing is in much of a of an organized fashion. So. Um, uh, just just have a, a, a structure in mind of, of how you're going to uh, pull the data from the machines and then where that data goes um, in, in terms of what workspace. OK, now I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through um, uh, what this actually looks like in in uh, in, my, in my demo here in a minute. <clears throat> so if we're uh, we, you know, getting back to uh, Syslog and Ceph, right? We can create data collection rules in the common event format via AMA connector. So the way that we do this, the, the way that we're going to pull data out of the Ceph logs is we, we, we've got the, the, the connector set up in our Sentinel workspace. We create a data collection rule on the connector page. So when you set up the connector, um, you have the option of creating a DCR on the connector page. You're going to define the target resources that you want to collect this data from. So uh, give it a list of all the machines where you want to collect this data from. And then um, uh, uh, you, 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 you just uh, uh, finalize the creation of the DCR. You'll also need to run an installation script on your Linux forwarding machine so that it reconfigures the daemon uh, to send the data properly uh, to the connector. OK. Now there was a question earlier about log stash and, and, and I think uh, Angelica posted uh, something about the um, use cases for for log stash. So, Sentinel has a log stash output plugin, which is currently in preview. And what it does is it it allows you to do what we call pipeline transformation um, using those data collection rules. So what happens is you have a bunch of different data sources, and these data sources can be just about any type you can imagine, right? In this case, we've got uh, representation of, of Amazon resources. We've got uh, stuff that's coming from a Beats plugin, from a database, from IoT devices, whatever it is. The, 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 these data sources can be any number of things. Um, the, the plugin is going to forward any type of logs from these external data sources into custom or potentially standardized tables in Microsoft Sentinel. So with the plugin that, that uh, uh, is used with Logstash, what you can do is control the configuration of the column names and the types of data that you're pulling in. You can do ingestion time transformations which means you can do things like filtering out certain types of data or you can enrich certain types of data. So you can um, enhance the data with perhaps uh, maybe data from a watch list or something like that, which we'll talk about uh, later on. But you can say, you know, I've, I've pulled this data from this, uh, you know, this database source and it's come in here, but I want to see you know, was the login that was attempted on this database, would, did it originate from a um, an IP address that's on our watch list? So Logstash can can uh, allow you to do some of that, uh, that that type of enrichment, although it may be faster to do it in Sentinel. Um, it also allows you to ingest custom logs into a custom type table, or you can ingest syslog input um, into the Sentinel syslog table. So like, like I said, just to kind of rehash this, this uh, concept, the way this works is you have your different data sources over here on the left. Um, they're configured to send their data logs to this VM, which is essentially a forwarder. Um, this, this VM is configured to run the log stash um, engine. So the log stash engine is made up of these three components that you see at the bottom. The input plugin um, uh, allows you to have a customized collection of data from different sources, right? The filter plugin allows you to manipulate and normalize the data according to the criteria that you care about. So you can put data in a certain format 
so that when you send it on to Sentinel, it's in a uh, kind of a, a more standardized format or more normalized format. And then the output plugin customizes the sending of the collected and processed data to the various destinations. So when um, uh, the, the, the Sentinel output plugin for Logstash sends data to Sentinel um, in JSON format to your Log Analytics workspace, and it does this over the Log Analytics HTTP Data Collector REST API. And then that data that is sent to Sentinel is ingested into a set of custom logs, a table that is made up of custom logs. So that's that's kind of how the Logstash uh, uh, plugin um, works and 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 is structured. Um, it is a little more uh, of, of an advanced uh, capability uh, for for many organizations, but it can be very useful if you've got a, a very um, you know complex environment with data sources that uh, you know don't follow any any standardized formatting. All right, so let's go take a look at uh, data collection rules real quick. So <clears throat> I go into my dashboard and I've got, uh, a, you know, just do a quick search, data collection rules, and you've got your data collection rules there. That's all I did. So I've got here a Windows DCR data collection rule. Now, what I have here is the ability to say, um, what are the data sources? that I'm collecting uh, from, from these machines. In this case, I'm collecting performance counters, right? So I can define my, uh, you know, what, uh, what rates I, I, I want to collect from. But as you can see here, I can also do things like Windows event logs. I can't change it while the, the thing's running, but uh, um, I can also say these are where I want the, the uh, logging, the logs to be sent. So in this case, I'm saying I want to go to this namespace for DB Sentinel, and it's the Azure Monitor logs. Let me go back here. And then the resources tell me what machines am I getting this information from? So I can be very specific, right? So, so think of the scenario that, that I was describing before where you've got some developers that want to collect performance information on their set of machines. Right, you may not want to collect performance counters from every machine in your environment. And so what you can do is be very targeted in which resources you would collect that data from. And so you can have multiple DCR rules or data collection rules and only have a certain uh, set of resources associated with this performance rule. So I've got certain machines that I've got set up uh, to collect the performance data from, and only that data is going to go to that uh, uh, that, that specific workspace. And so my developers can query that workspace and get the performance data for just uh, the stuff that they care about. So as I mentioned, you, you can have multiple DCR uh, for for your or, uh, your uh, your environment. Um, in this case, I just have a single one set up, but you can set up uh, DCRs for Linux machines, for um, any types of machines. And actually, let's... Uh, Let's go into a different view here. And let's do Seth. All right, so keep in mind, um, there are two different ways that we can get common event format into Sentinel. There's the legacy agent, and then there's the AMA agent. The AMA agent is the one that uses DCRs. So if I go here, I just clicked on it. I go open connector page. <clears throat> So I can't configure this uh, because the, the connector is you know, in operation and running, but here's where you create your data collection rule. And that data collection rule would just go into the same location uh, that I showed you before. You'd configure it uh, for uh, collecting uh, for Linux agents. I think actually I can probably do one real quick here for uh, Linux. Um, let me back up here. and go to data connectors. Just look at the ones that are connected. And 
I've got the one for Windows there. So there you can see that I created that uh, that data collection rule and it's as created by API. But here's how here that here's how that would be done, right? So I do uh, domain controller. DCR, right? All right, care about different uh, types of events for domain controllers. I set up the resources that I'm going to look at. <clears throat> so maybe only the DC. I want to collect, uh, let's do all security events, that's fine. Do review and create. <clears throat> And there we go. So now I've got another DCR that is set up to collect only security information from my domain controller machine. Uh, should show up here in just a second under this configuration. Whoops, or it can break everything. Let's go back to my Sentinel workspace. All that to show that I now have a DCR for the domain controller, right? So that's uh, that's for doing the uh, the Windows one. If I want to do one, whoops, I went too far back there. <clears throat> if I want to do the one for uh, the Ceph connector, um, I don't think I'll be able to do any configuration of it because I don't have anything connected. But uh, here's oh, I can. Okay, so data collection rule. So I can do Linux ECR. Now I don't have any resources. I don't have any Linux machines. Oh, actually, do I? I might. Maybe not in this. Oh, I do. There we go. And uh, what uh, what's the so, so, so with, with uh, syslog, you've got uh, what we call facilities, which is kind of, you know, where uh, uh, what type of activity are you logging? So authentication, privilege authentication, scheduled tasks, cron jobs, um, you know, kernel activity, stuff like that. So what's the logging activity I care about? And there's different logging activities. So I'm going to do warning for these two. Review and create. And if we don't break Sentinel, let this finish just to make sure that it doesn't fall over. There we go. So now I've got a uh, a DCR that's set up to collect specific types of data from that one Linux machine in my environment. So that's how you set up your um, DCRs that can collect either from Logstash, from Windows, or just uh, from your standard uh, kind of Linux machines. So let's get started. OK, so for multiple tenant management to work properly, your tenant, uh, the MSSP's tenant, has to have Microsoft Sentinel resource providers registered on at least one subscription. In addition to that, each of your customers' tenants must have the resource providers registered as well. So if you have registered Microsoft Sentinel in your tenant and your customer has registered it in theirs, then you're ready to get started. So um, just to kind of step back a, a step, Azure Lighthouse is a service that allows MSSPs, partners who are managing security for customers, and managing Sentinel for customers. It allows them to manage multiple Sentinel workspaces across tenants and at scale. So to onboard a Sentinel tenant into your Azure Lighthouse environment, the steps that you follow are what we see here on the slides. So you're going to register the Sentinel resource providers on at least one subscription in your tenant. So you're the managing tenant and you're going to register them in 
each customer tenant that you want to manage. You then will onboard each customer subscription to Azure Lighthouse using either Azure Delegated Resource Management or Azure Resource Manager templates. So this will grant specific users in your tenant access and permissions to perform different management operations on the Microsoft Sentinel workspace that is configured in your customer tenant. So essentially what you're doing is you're saying, uh, I'm, I'm defining who in my organization is allowed to touch Sentinel stuff in my customer tenant, right? That's what this part is for. The last part here is you're gonna use any of these or all of these uh, components, either the Azure portal, which we see here, or you can use PowerShell, you can use the Azure CLI in order to manage the Sentinel workspaces for your customer tenants. So you also have the ability to use the Sentinel API to perform operations programmatically. So if you build um, your own uh, kind of uh, tooling uh, that will allow you to connect to customer tenants and, and perform operations against that tenant, um, then, then that can also be done through the API. Now, there are a couple constraints that you have to be aware of when you are using uh, Lighthouse. <clears throat> so when you're using Lighthouse, you will not be able to deploy connectors in Sentinel from within a managed workspace. So in order to deploy a connector, and you saw me uh, uh, working with connectors in, in the, the previous session, I was working with the Ceph uh, through using the AMA connector. Um, but in order to deploy something like that, you have to directly sign into the tenant where you want to deploy the connector and then you authenticate there with the necessary permissions. OK, so this is at a very, very high level how you would connect multiple tenants to your Azure tenant um, and allow you to to uh, perform tasks against that tenant workspace. So to take uh, full advantage of Sentinel's capabilities, um, it is recommended that you use a single workspace environment, but there are some work um, use cases where you are going to have multiple workspaces. That might be um, in, in the case of, of you as a partner, you may be a managed security provider. So you may have multiple Sentinel tenants, as you see here. What we have in this case is what we call the multi workspace or multiple workspace view. And so this lets you um, select multiple Sentinel tenants that you have Lighthouse uh, capabilities uh, to manage. And then you can go in and view incidents across all these workspaces. So you get, uh, um, when, when you open Sentinel, you're presented with a list of these different workspaces that you have access to across all tenants, all subscriptions. Now, this would also be true if you had a very large multinational organization that had Sentinel deployed in multiple locations. So in this case, uh, these are all you know, kind of within Microsoft um, uh, groupings of Sentinel, but uh, the, the same scenario uh, could be visible if you have a, a, a large organization where you've deployed Sentinel, uh, maybe for the European group uh, to accommodate GDPR, and then another um, instance of Sentinel in Asia, and then another one in North America, and one in uh, South America. So, so you, you'd have the same visibility um, and, and the same ability to use Lighthouse um, if you have a multinational. So, um, in order to get the, the, the visibility, uh, keep in mind that you can only see a maximum of 100 workspaces using Sentinel. And that is a constraint that some of our larger MSSPs do have to take into consideration, right? Um, this is not the only way that you can manage multiple workspaces. Um, there are vendors who have created tooling that allows you to manage hundreds of, of workspaces at a time using um, you know, customized tooling. 
and uh, and they sell that as, as a product. Um, but right now, uh, if you want to do the, the the free version, right? If you just want to do what's available within Microsoft Tools, um, you're you're maxed out at 100 workspaces. The other constraint is right now you can only view incidents. Okay, so. Um, I'll show you this when, when, when I do the demo, but uh, when you click on view incidents, uh, you are going to see the incidents, but different from the standard Sentinel workspace, um, where you have you know, a couple dozen uh, uh, blades here on, on the left-hand side, you only have incidents here. So you don't see things like workbooks and uh, notebooks and logs and, and all the other things that, that, that show up here when you log into a specific Sentinel workspace, um, you only see incidents. So when you go into the incidents themselves and you click in and you start uh, digging deeper into the incident itself, it takes you into the specific Sentinel instance where that, uh, where that incident occurred. But at a high level, um, this is all that's visible to you as an MSSP. Now, the other thing uh, that you can leverage, and, and Angelica is going to talk about this in much more detail, uh, I think tomorrow, is the idea of repositories. So I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here, but this is one of the, the, the concepts that's, that's going to uh, be important for um, MSSPs if they want to deploy content to their customers. So, um, what a, what a, uh, a repository allows you to do is it allows you to create locations where you can create content such as in GitHub or Azure DevOps, and this becomes uh, what we refer to as your source of truth. So um, this is where you uh, maybe author all of your analytics rules, your automation rules, your hunting queries, um, parsers, playbooks, workbooks, whatever, you, you, you source them in this GitHub or Azure DevOps repository. And then from there, um, it is stored as an ARM template, and this allows you then to um, push this, this content out to your customer uh, Sentinel locations, right? So, so this the, the, this becomes kind of the uh, as it's described here, the source control, and uh, you deploy this ARM template out to your customers' Sentinel instances, and uh, then then you have a kind of a standardized way of uh, making sure that everybody has the same rules and and workbooks and whatever. Now, keep in mind that the repository, whether it's GitHub or DevOps, it is not validating the content of your ARM template, right? So, so you, you create an ARM template that's got all these, these uh, components, your rules, your parsers, whatever. It's got all this stuff. All you're doing is storing it, right? Um, it's not validating that you have your JSON uh, structured correctly, or you know the, 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 that it's formatted correctly. It's just a way of of storing um, the the configuration. Um, if you choose to use Sentinel repositories to deploy customized content in your production Sentinel workspaces, the repository that you connect to, um, as I described before, is your single source of truth. So that means. The, the, the other thing that this means is that the content from your repository will overwrite any changes that you make to uh, or, or, or that, that has been made to the content in the customer's Sentinel portal. So if they have customized um, an analytics rule and then you come in and you push the analytics rules back down, it's going to overwrite any any changes that they've made. So if you make changes um, or, or, or if your, your customer makes changes, um, you want to make sure that the uh, uh, that, that they first of all take note of it or that um, 
the content in your repository is updated and your deployment um, is not going to overwrite your, your your customer's data right so in 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 most cases with um uh mssps you're going to be in charge of of all that anyway the, the customer isn't going to be doing a lot of updating of the analytics rules anyway um, but just to be aware that uh, this becomes the single source of truth and it will overwrite whatever is in the uh in the customer organization this is also a good way to do things like um updating uh template analytic rules <clears throat> so so we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow but uh, from time to time there are a number of analytic rules that microsoft makes available through the data connectors and from time to time they update them they, they update, update the underlying kql or something like that and when they do that um, you need to update the uh, rules that are being deployed in your environments and so uh, using repositories to do that can be a, uh, a quick way of making sure that that happens. Right. All right, so let's talk about um, basic analytics log ingestion, search, archiving, and data restoration. Now, I've only got 15 minutes to cover this, so I, I obviously can't go into a ton of detail about this, but I'll try to cover uh, some of the, the main points and some of the things that might be uh, maybe new to you. So let's talk about the basic and analytics log ingestion. Um, so Azure Monitor, uh, the, 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 the logging foundation that, that, that we use here, um, gives you two different log data plans that can help you to reduce your log ingestion and retention costs. <clears throat> so by default, the analytics log data plan gives you the ability to um, do analysis of the content in the logging um, and it gives you uh, some of the azure monitor features things like alerting and uh, being able to be used by by other services it has uh, a, a a regular i don't want to say regular but uh, the you know the standard ingestion cost there is no cost per query and it does allow for longer term retention, which is what you see down here. It gives you the retention periods and the archive periods. It is important to note that it also supports full K, uh, KQL capabilities. If you go to the basic logging data plan, you can save on the cost of ingesting and storing uh, some of your maybe high volume uh, very verbose logs, like uh, Andrew Dill mentioned, like firewalls. Uh, firewalls are constantly, constantly generating logs, and, and they, they, there can be uh, an enormous amount of logging uh, from, from a very busy firewall. So you can bring that type of logging in using the basic log data plan, and um, you know it, it, it can be good for things like debugging, troubleshooting, and auditing, but not necessarily for generating analytics and alerts. Now, this comes with a, a reduced ingestion cost, but there is a cost for every query that you run against a, basics, uh, a basic log um, uh, repository. And it also has a shorter retention period by quite a bit, right? So the amount of time that you can interact with the logs in an analytics workspace is from four to 730 days. With the basic logs, eight days. That's it, right? There, there, there's no um, no flexibility with that uh, uh, with basic. Um, so, so how do you make the decision uh, as to whether or not you want to use basic logs? Think about using basic logs when number one, you don't need more than eight days worth of data uh, for your table. Um, Maybe you only require basic queries of the data uh, using just a, a subset of the KQL uh, language. And also, would the cost savings for data ingestion exceed the expected cost for the queries, right? 
So um, you, know, you want to make sure that you're you're not spending so much on the individual queries that it uh, negates the ingestion cost of the logs, right? So, so, so you're saving on ingestion, but you're paying per query. But if you spend too much on the queries, then you uh, have negated this this uh, reduction in cost. So if that if that proves to be true, then in, ingest them as analytics logs. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that not every type of table um, in your log analytics workspace is going to support basic logs. So uh, there, there may be certain tables that uh, you can't even uh, use for uh, basic logs. All right, so you do have the ability to change the table plan from an analytics log to a basic log if that's the direction you want to go. The way you would do this is you go into your log analytics workspace, you have a blade called tables, and this is where all the tables uh, that make up your, your logging for Sentinel are stored. So you may have logging for your Palo Alto firewall, you may have logging for Azure AD activity, for Azure activity, for all these different uh, types of data, they go into their own kind of custom table. They don't just, just get put into one big pile. They're, they're, they're separated out into these different tables. So you find the table that is relevant to you and uh, that, that you want to change the uh, type of table. <clears throat> So, um, so you find the table uh, whose value you want to change from basic to analytics. And then over on the, uh, uh, the right hand side, when, when you click on this, you, you'll see that there's an ellipsis here. There's little three dots, right? So you'll click on that, those, those three dots <clears throat> and that'll give you the ability to manage the table. And when you open this up, what it'll show you is a drop down with the table plan. And so you can switch from analytics to basic, um, you know, assuming again that the uh, the type of table supports the basic table plan. Now, so something that we'll talk about in just a few minutes here is retention as well. So you have information down here about the interactive retention as well as the archive period. So interactive retention means how long can I actually run queries against this data versus how long am I storing the data, right? So um, this is kind of an interesting area to, to look around and, and uh, kind of get a, a, an estimate of where your um, uh, uh, you know, costs are being incurred uh, with uh, with storage. Uh, notice also data collection rules. You know what data collection rules are being applied to this table. Um, so we talked about data collection rules in the previous session. Okay, so switching gears, search. <clears throat> now, search might might seem kind of straightforward, uh, but there is a little bit more to it than just uh, running a, a standard search. So one of the primary activities of a security team, obviously, is to search for specific types of events. So, for example, you might search your logs for the activities of a specific user that take place within a given time frame, the last six hours, the last 12 hours, whatever. In Sentinel, you can also search across much longer time periods with extremely large data sets um, by using what we call a search job. So while you can run a search job on any type of log, search jobs are ideally suited to searching through archived logs. So remember we have the interactive logs as well as the archived logs. So search jobs work best against archive logs. Now, if you need to do a full investigation of your archive data, what you can do is actually do a restore of that data, which brings it into uh, what you might consider the hot cache um, of data. And then that allows you to run very high performance queries uh, and with deeper analysis capabilities um, against that data. But, but when we run search jobs, um, what we're doing is we're, we're running queries against very, very large data sets 
that might be uh, uh, very long running uh, uh, queries. And so uh, the, ways that, the way that we can do this is you click on your ellipsis in your uh, log analytics query uh, view, click on the ellipsis, you get this search job mode. And then when you get that search job mode, you have this um, uh, button that says search job, and this allows you to create these very, uh, you know, uh, data intensive uh, queries. So you use a search job when you start an investigation to find specific events in your logs within a given time frame. So you can search all your logs to find events that match your criteria, and then you can filter through the results. <clears throat> There are options um, that, that you might want to consider, right? There are, um, you have the ability to run a search job, but you can also, as I mentioned before, run a restore job. So you can restore the logs from archive so that they are in um, the, uh, uh, the hot cache and you can run queries against them using uh, the high performance KQL versus the search job. Uh, kind of just runs for a long, long time because it's a large data set. Keep in mind that search jobs are asynchronous queries. They go out, they fetch records, and they return the results of that query to their own search table. So it creates its own search table in your log analytics work workspace um, when you create a search job. The search job then uses parallel processing to run the search across uh, long time spans or across very large data sets. So search jobs uh, do not have an impact on your active Sentinel workspaces performance or its availability. Um, before you start a search job, you have to be aware of some of the limitations of search. So. Number one, um, when you run a search job, you can only it, it should be optimized to query only one table at a time, right? So you don't want to query against uh, you know multiple tables because you're already uh, querying against a very large data set on less performant uh, data, right? This is archive data, so it's not going to perform as well and you're looking at a whole bunch of data. So optimize your query so that you're only looking at one table at a time. Um, you do have limits on, on how, how far back you can search. The limit right now is uh, seven years. Um, it does support long running searches, but it will time out at 24 hours. So if the search runs for, for 24 hours, um, it's gonna drop, but that's still better than um, the 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 standard uh, timeout of 10 minutes. That if, if you ran just a standard search um, or, or your KQL query, um, it would time out after 10 minutes. But with the search function, you have the ability to run queries that last 24 hours. Uh, the results that you get back are limited to a million records. Um, you can only have five searches running simultaneously um, in in your workspace. Um, yeah, so, so, so I mean, the, the, there's things to keep in mind. You can take a look at the limitations of the search and uh, uh, understand some of the things that uh, might be important. So once the search is completed, remember what, what I was describing is that the search um, creates its own table. And once it's completed, you're going to see um, a table with the uh, underscore SRCH suffix. So as we see here, this is a search that was run uh, called all net one underscore SRCH. So this is the table that has been created by our job. It's uh, stored under save searches. And um, you can then go in and query that set of data that has been pulled into uh, this location for you to to run your search against. <clears throat> you can also view the search, uh, the, the results of the search query. So they are down here. Um, notice also that you can restore the data. So um, while while we've done um, uh, this this uh, long running search, 
the data has stayed in place, right, in, in, in the archive area. But we can restore that data so that it's in uh, kind of the, the hot cache area and uh, can then um, uh, run, run more complex and, and faster KQL queries against it. Um, it is also important to keep in mind that you can delete the search results when your investigation is complete uh, just by clicking on the delete button. You, know, you check the box and click delete. Um, and you want to do that because, again, this has created its own table and tables equal storage and storage equals a cost, right? All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like in real life. So we're going to look at a, a uh, search first. So let's go to back here. All right, so here's search. Now again, keep in mind, this is different. If I go to logs and I run a query, I can run a query here. This is running against the, the, the currently active data in my Sentinel log analytics workspace. And so in, in a sense, I'm running a search against those, those logs, but the search function is different. The search function allows me to run queries against very large data sets. So if I go here, so, so I can say uh, search for Risky users. Oh, it's not letting me do that. Anyway, let's go back here to, to save searches. So here's the example that, that I showed you a few minutes ago, the all net one search. <clears throat> so if I look here at the, the search results, it's going to show me what has already been pulled back from uh, the, the pre-configured search. So um, as you can see here, the start search time, uh, well, Let's see where, where it started and ended. Uh, search started at 131, 2023, 405. It didn't, it didn't take a long time to actually uh, uh, run the search. Um, notice we're at a million results, so it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big search. But it's got, it's kind of hard to see what's going on here. There we go. Um, I've got data that uh, was pulled back from, from this search. So, so the search looked through a whole bunch of networking data, for example, right? And um, it found data specific to a certain type of thing within a certain time frame. And so um, I have this table now called all that one underscore search that is uh, specific to that type of data. I'm going to make this a little, it's going to be a little bit harder to see, but you can start to see some of the uh, uh, the content that might be useful in your um, uh, your, 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 your searching. So uh, I can look at the results in log analytics. I can run some additional actions like deleting the results or the deleting the search. Um, and then I can restore the data to, to perform my investigations. So that's uh, uh, the value of, of search is that the, it, it, it's queried a very, very large data set and collected information about this specific query into its own table. And now I can kind of narrow down what I'm looking for. So, so think, think of an example, like um, I'm looking for a specific IP address that I feel has uh, been trying to um, attack my, um, uh, you know, a, a, a web server. And so, um, I want to see how far back this attack has been taking place. Now, there's a lot of logging that's taken place on my web server because people are always accessing it and uh, other people are always you know, trying to attack it and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff is happening, but I want to look for this specific um, IP address. So I might configure its own specific search for the last six months. Now, that, that uh, query would probably fail if I just ran it here against the logs. First of all, it wouldn't go back six months, but secondly, it would be so much data that, that it would time out. So I create the, the search query here and um, uh, run the query and it pulls back that data into its own uh, table 
and and I can then kind of narrow down how I'm going to investigate the the attack um, using that logic. So like I said, by default, all tables in your workspace are going to inherit the workspaces interactive settings, right? So the, this is going to be checked by default on all the tables in your workspace. But as I mentioned, you can set a different policy on individual tables by unchecking this box. And when you uncheck that box, you uh, it, that it makes it possible for you to change the interactive retention uh, settings to whatever you want for that specific table. So you can change the interactive retention time frame, which is the length of time you'll be able to perform queries against the logs, as well as the total retention period, which defines how long the interactive logs plus the archive logs are kept in total. So you have to combine the interactive lifetime of your logs with the archive length of time for your logs, and that gives you your total retention period. And that was why we had those two different colors. Um, let's go back here. Uh, we had those two different colors. In this case, everything was interactive, um, but uh, if we had an archive period, we'd have a longer perhaps uh, bar of orange here that would give us the total retention period for those logs. Uh, the only exception to this is the uh, what is now legacy, the free trial pricing tier. Um, so so if you have any data that's in the, the legacy free trial pricing tier, this this uh, capability is not available to you. OK, the restore operation. <clears throat> so the restore operation and the search operation kind of um, are, are two sides of the same coin, you might say. So the restore operation makes a specific time range of data in a table available for your high performance queries. So when you use a restore operation, you are querying data in the archived logs location. You can also use the restore operation to run queries within a specific time range on an analytics table when the log queries you run don't exceed 10 minutes, right? So 10 minutes is the timeout on your um, queries against your analytics logs. Now the question is, what is the difference between search and restore? Why would you use search versus using restore um, if you're looking for, for certain types of data? And the answer really comes down to um, do you know what you're looking for specifically, or do you just know the time frame when something happened? So, so to, to think about it uh, like, like this, you would use a search job when you're looking for something specific, for example, related to uh, a server named server 001, or a specific user, or a specific IP address. You know what you're looking for, you just want to get um, uh, as much data back about that thing as possible. A restore job means that you want to look for things that happened during a time period, right? You want to be able to perform in-depth queries of logs from a specific time frame. This isn't, you know, strictly, you know, you can only use it this way or only use it that way, but, but as a general rule of thumb, this is kind of the idea. So you might use a restore job if you want to query your firewall logs from January 1st to January 15th. You're not looking for a specific thing. You're just you're saying pull these logs back and I need to do queries against all of them. I need all the data, but I need to be able to perform faster queries against them. Search jobs are uh, maybe slower running queries, but you know specifically what you're looking for. So hopefully that that helps helps you understand a little bit better um, the scenarios where you use search versus restore. <clears throat> All right, moving on to watch lists. <clears throat> so watch lists. Um, watch lists allow you to correlate data from a data source that you provide with events 
that are being ingested into your Sentinel environment. So for example, you might create a watch list with a list of what you deem to be high value assets, right? Uh, machines that um, have, have uh, sensitive data on them, uh, machines that are being run by people that have um, high privileges, um, machines that are run by you know, people that, that are in the C-suite, right? You, you can say, these are my high value assets. I want, um, whenever something shows up in a log related to those high value assets, I want to know about it. You can also do it for something like terminated employees. So if, uh, if you have a list of terminated employees and you start seeing their login um, on some of your systems, that's, that's a, something to look at, right? Service accounts. If service accounts are being used to interactively log in with a machine, that's not a good thing, right? Service accounts shouldn't be doing interactive logins uh, for the most part. So you, you define what it is you want to watch out for, import that list into Sentinel, and it will correlate the, the, the data that you've brought in with the logs that, that are being brought in from all these other data sources. Um, watch lists are stored in Sentinel as name value pairs, and they are cached so that the uh, performance impact of those watch lists is uh, you know, very minimal and, and there's very low latency. The maximum number of watch list items you can have in your Sentinel environment is 10 million if you have more than 10 million entities that you want to ingest. I mean, maybe you've got a ton of IP addresses or file hashes or something, then you can ingest them using custom logs, right? Um, you cannot do um, cross workspace or lighthouse scenarios that use watch lists. So, so in other words, if you're trying to create a query that goes, um, you know, across workspaces, so, so, so let's say you've got a, a, a large company, you've got multiple instances, you've got multiple workspaces. You can create queries that go across workspaces, but you can't um, incorporate watch lists into that query, right? The, the watch lists must be used in the same workspace where they're referenced. So that's gonna come into play with, with, with your queries and your analytics rules and so on. Um, what else do I want to mention here? There's some size limits that you have to be aware of as far as the size of the um, watch list, but uh, but that's not something that you need to know right this second. Um, to update the watch list in Sentinel. So um, it is recommended that you edit existing watch lists rather than deleting and recreating them. Um, so if you have a watch list and you need to add to it or delete from it, um, just update the watch list, right? Go, go in and edit watch list items and then um, you know, make the changes that you need to. Um, it, 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 it's just uh, uh, more efficient uh, than, than deleting everything and then recreating it uh, with a new list. Um, the part of the reason for that is that Log Analytics has a five minute SLA for data ingestion. And if you delete and recreate that watch list, you might see both the deleted and the recreated entries in Log Analytics during that um, during that five minute window. So, so that's that's kind of the technical reason behind it. Um, you can query data in any table um, against data from any watch list by treating the watch list as its own table. So you can use it with uh, joins and lookups. <clears throat> so for example, if you want to run a query against a watch list, you use this uh, uh, this this format, the underscore get watch list, and you define the name of the watch list that you want to get we get data from. Um, there's also the concept of a search key. So a search key, is the name of a column in your watch list that you expect will be used uh, as a join with other data or as a frequent object of searches. So what is, uh, how do we know what the search key is? Uh, let me 
get to it real quick. So your search key here, uh, when you click on edit watch list items, you get your search key here, country or region. So this is what we expect queries to kind of hinge on um, that, that, that people are going to be looking for country or region. And so that's the search key that we're uh, defining for this specific watch list. Um, the, uh, the, the, the the search key is also referenced here in your query. So, so it's this uh, on dollar left dot remote IP country. It, it, it's not the same as this this screenshot, but uh, whoops. I lost uh, lost my teams there for a second. Um, in this particular case, remote IP country is the watch list item uh, or, or the uh, search key for for this particular table. All right, analytics rules. I'm going to try to get through this quickly, but there's a lot to cover. Um, Angelica is going to be covering fusion, so I'm not going to touch that. We, we're not going to be touching uh, every single one of these analytic rule detection types. We're just going to be touching on some of the more common ones um, and, and near real time uh, uh, types of rules. So <clears throat> the most common types of rules that you're going to run into are the built in analytics rules. So when you connect one of your data connectors, to Sentinel, there are built in analytics rules <clears throat> that come with that data connector. And it's important that you enable all the associated rules um, when you connect your data source so that you're getting full security coverage for uh, your environment. Um, the most efficient way to do this is to do it directly from the connector. Uh, so, so it's going to list any related rules uh, associated with the connector and you just uh, uh, enable it. If you are a uh, security provider, um, you can also push rules to Sentinel using an API or PowerShell um, rather than doing this uh, manually in each customer's Sentinel workspace. When you're using API or PowerShell, you first have to export the rules to JSON before you enable them um, and, and, and push them or before you push them and enable them in your customer environments. Um, but it can be valuable to do it this way because it allows you to do this at, at scale very quickly. And, and like I mentioned before, this can be done using repositories. So how do you export the rules? Um, when you export your rules, so, so you go into your analytics rules, you highlight one of them and you click export or import either way. Um, it will export them as ARM template files, and then you can import rules from those files as part of managing your Sentinel deployments as code. So the export action, as I mentioned, will create a JSON file in your browser's download location. And then you can rename it, move it, whatever you want to do, just like with any other file. Now keep in mind that the exported JSON file is also workspace independent. So the exported file can be imported into other works, uh, workspaces and even other tenants. And because it's simply viewed as code, you can also version control these uh, uh, exported files. And so you can manage your uh, CICD framework um, using that that version control capability. Um, the file is going to include all the parameters that are defined in this analytics rule. So um, if you've got uh, a rule like this, you know, uh, threat intelligence map by P entity to network session events, if there are scheduling settings for running that rule, um, severity settings for the rule, right? We've got medium for this one. Um, any incident creation settings, event and alert grouping settings, um, associated MITRE attack tactics, and uh, you know any other thing associated with this goes along with the rule. So when you import it um, into another environment, it carries all the elements of the rule that existed in the original um, location. So any type of analytics rule, not just scheduled rules, um, can be exported uh, to a JSON file. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, you can also create custom analytics rules. And the easiest way to do that is to start with an existing rule as a template or reference. So you take one of the existing rules um, that you know is working <clears throat> and you use that as the starting point for your um, environment. Um, it is recommended that you build your query using an ASIM parser. And I think we talk about ASIM um, in one of the upcoming sessions. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Indranil or Angelica, but I think we talked about ASIM. Um, rather than using your native tables, um, so, so, so you want to create this uh, 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 associated with an ASIM parser um, in order to future proof your query. So, for example, if uh, if logon data is one of the um, uh, values that you're looking for in your rule, um, you might want to use the parsing or the the, the ASIM syntax for logon data rather than the um, format that is used natively by uh, the vendor. And what that does is it allows you to get log on data information regardless of who the vendor is and how they um, how they name that type of data. So some of them might call it user log on, some of it might call it login data, some of it might call it login, you know, uh, information or whatever. So so you want to use ASIM parsers to kind of standardize and future proof any queries that you build. Uh, so that they're not, uh, they, they don't become obsolete. Keep in mind that the that any queries, uh, any custom analytics rules, cannot use uh, the 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 search or union functions, or or, or operators, I should say. Um, but you can use user defined functions in your queries, and you also have to be careful about your lookback periods and ingestion latency. So what this is talking about is um, look back is saying how far back am I going to look in my query to find this information? And ingestion latency comes into play when you think about how um, uh, there, there might be uh, delays in data being ingested, in, in, ingested into your Sentinel workspace. So you have to factor in or, or account for latency that might occur between the time that an event is generated at its source and the time that it gets ingested into Sentinel and the rule gets fired, right? So Sentinel runs scheduled analytics rules on a five minute delay from their scheduled time. So um, just make sure that you're, you're factoring in the ingestion delay um, uh, in into the way that you construct your your query and the loop uh, look back period. I'll show you uh, one way that you can determine that in a minute. <clears throat> Near real time detection analytics rules. So there are some types of alerts that you might want to get um, faster than the out of the box, you know, uh, uh, scheduled uh, 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 query rule time frame. So. <clears throat> Near real time analytics run on uh, one minute intervals. Otherwise, the way that they're structured is exactly the same as standard analytics rules. They're not built any different. It's just how often they run. A couple things that uh, you have to be aware of with NRTs. Um, they don't allow for query scheduling because obviously they have their own schedule of one minute. Um, there is a threshold. Uh, or, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, alert threshold is irrelevant um, because an alert is always generated for an NRT detection. And then with event groupings, you are limited to a maximum of uh, 30, um, 30 alerts for each event. <clears throat> Limitations, uh, there are, you can run a maximum of 20 near real-time query rules in your environment. Um, Similar to uh, the thing we talked about earlier, uh, you should only refer to it. It can only refer to a single table, uh, and that's for speed purposes. There's no ability to do joins or unions in your query. And again, um, like we talked about before with the um, uh, uh, the analytics rules, you can't run them uh, across workspace. Or I, I, uh, what was it we talked about? The searches, I think, what it was. 
Um, this is kind of an interesting area too. So Sentinel comes with analytics rules uh, that you can use to um, you know, populate your, 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 your SIM. But what's important to keep in mind is that there are versions, right? So when you open some of your analytics rules from time to time, you might see uh, this new version available um, uh, pop up. And what this, this shows you what version you're currently running, 1.1.0, and what version is currently available, 1.3.0. Um, so what you can do is you can actually uh, go in and compare the existing uh, rule that you're running against uh, the, the, the new one, and it'll look something like this. So it'll show you the, the, the current uh, query that is uh, in, in operation in your environment versus the new query, things see how things have changed, and you can make a determination about whether or not you want to update the rule. Um, updating the rule will overwrite the template component of your existing rule, and if you then push that out to your customers, um, it will update the template for, for them as well. Um, so you want to take into account things like automations and customizations uh, to the original rule, uh, just to make sure that you're not breaking something when you update the template. So this is something to keep in mind so you're keeping your environment um, current and um, uh, up to date. <clears throat> um, I talked about the ingestion delay and your rules. So ingestion delay could impact the scheduled analytics rules and how, um, uh, you know, how, wh whether or not you actually get alerts for certain types of activities. Um, so, so you have to make sure that you're you're accounting for ingestion delay and making sure that you're covering uh, your bases there. So in order to correct your rules and, and, and set up your look back times correctly, the problem is you have to know how long your data is being delayed, right? You, you can't set your look back time appropriately if you don't know how far to look back. And so what comes in useful um, in determining how to structure your queries is this workspace usage report. So this is uh, one that's built into Sentinel. It's, it's one of your workbooks. And if you go into this workspace usage report, it will show you the ingestion latency for your logs. And so you can look at something like Windows Firewall and you can see that uh, the, the ingestion delay is pretty significant for, for your Windows Firewall logs. And so if you have queries that are doing a look back and you know, you're, you're looking at uh, changes to your Windows Firewall, um, then, then you can uh, account for this ingestion delay in the way that you structure your query so that you're getting um, valuable alerting. So th th this is a, a, a relatively complicated thing to, to talk about. I, I just want to make sure that I brought this to your attention and especially the workspace usage report because it's a really valuable uh, tool to take a look at. So let's take a look at it real quick. This is the last thing I'm going to share. Uh, so if I go to my workbooks and I locate, let's just, let's do it. Let's walk through it. So if I go to my workbooks and look up usage, there's my workspace usage report. You save workbook and it will build. Now, one thing that uh, is important to note here is that you have to change the detail level. Well, actually, maybe not. Nope, you don't. <clears throat> I thought you had to. Um, but it's going to give me my end-to-end -end latency report by table. So all the tables um, that are in my um, Azure Sentinel workspace are listed here. So these are all the tables that are showing up, and it's showing me the, uh, the latency. So uh, there's my Windows firewall. So I've got like a 13 hour latency. So if I'm going to create a um, a, uh, a query around Windows Firewall information, I have to create the look back period uh, to account for this uh, latency, right? I, I have to look back whatever 14 hours 
um, to make sure that I'm capturing all the information possible. Otherwise, I might only be looking back the last five minutes and I would miss 13 and a half hours worth of, of uh, log data in my query. So that's the idea behind um, understanding the latency for the ingestion of your logs, right? So uh, this is this is pretty valuable information. Um, there's also, you know, uh, other other data in here that's that's really useful that you can uh, take a look at. But uh, th this is one of the uh, the the most valuable workbooks that you can uh, take a look at in your in your environment. Lots of lots of good data.